Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the David Silverfleck Podcast. I'm your host. Today, my guest is Dave Baldwin. Dave Baldwin is a business consultant with a background in accounting. Is that correct, Dave? Yes, I have a bit of a varied background. You do. I, I people. I've had several different careers, but basically from for the first 10 years of my career, I was mainly doing a combination of computer programming, control systems, and running wires through electrical cabinets until I decided to start my own business in 2007, which is when I first got into marketing. Uh, <clears throat> I kind of found myself in marketing because just through a series of conversations with small business owners, trying to get a better understanding of where their challenges were. Marketing and getting customers seemed to be the biggest thing that came up the most consistently and just concerns about being able to keep the lights on month after month, which really came down to, am I gonna have enough people putting cash in the register? So over about the next, you know, and that was 14 years ago, but I will say over the next five to 10 years after that, I found that, that my role was slowly evolving because what seems to be a marketing problem in many cases is actually not a marketing problem. Uh, one, one example is you can have, you can easily have a capacity problem or a capability problem in a business where they, the, essentially a business owner wants to get more customers, but they're not actually ready for those customers to show up when they do. That's key. And yeah. Yeah. That's, and I think it's a much bigger issue than a lot of, a lot of uh, inexperienced business owners know how to recognize early on. So I found myself as I, I started to see more and more of those types of issues, getting into more of an operations role. And I, I started finding that it was no longer strictly about marketing, but it was more about figuring out the overall issues with the business. I kind of thought back to my days in, as a field service tech and doing electronics work. And I thought, well, if I'm going to troubleshoot a system, I got to look at the whole system. So yeah, that's, that's what I was going to ask you is it uh, because it seems like you can't you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And 99% yeah. of the time, it's it's, you know, I always tell business owners, you don't need a website. You think getting the Wix or Weebly or Squarespace or whatever template is going to make you number one in Google. You're going to get a million phone calls and it's that simplified, but there's too many working parts that need to be put in order. There's too many different things going on. And unless you're already an expert, you're not going to know what to do or how to do it. So you're putting the cart before the horse. Yep. Absolutely. No, I think you and I are very much on the same page about how that, I mean, what, and what you described there is what I think is, is a classic fallacy in judgment where really if you're fixated on the idea that a website is going to be the thing that's going to bring you customers, really what you're dealing with is, is you need to have customers and there needs to be a way of getting customers. A website may be a piece of the puzzle, but if you don't have all the other pieces supporting that website, and if the website isn't set up correctly, then it's it, it may be a perfect website. It may be perfectly optimized for Google, like you're saying. But it's you know the the phone's still not going to ring if you don't do all the other things correctly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, just as a brief example, I a long time ago I worked with a client who was an optician, and I, they were number one in you know part of our deal. Uh, other than the obvious glasses, was, you know, look, I'll make you number one in Google. I'll make you number one in Yahoo. It's not hard to do because there's no competition where where they were geographically. There's nobody else had any opti optician websites that had any SEO. And um, certainly not local. So part of the, the, the agreement was I can make you number one in Google. It's not going to be a problem. They did not and probably still today don't know that they were number one in Google or if they are now. All they know is they're getting more phone calls and more emails than they can handle. So they're not checking and they're not generating, they're not really helping me keep them at that place, no fault of their own really. But it's like, if you were to give me more content for blogs and give me more stuff so I could link to scholarly research about optical issues and eye care and things like that, I could keep you at number one indefinitely. But this seems to be endemic for the majority of business owners who have these pie in the sky aspirations, but don't see the connection. 
it's like that that quote Thoreau said, build your castles in the air, for that is where they should be. Now put your foundation beneath it. Why is that? Well, I think that the example you give about a business owner that, you know, whether, regardless of the type of business, where they have expectations, but those aren't fulfilled. I think one of the things that Jack Welch, the former CEO of General Electric, was famous mm -hmm. for was elevating the role of HR in an organization because people perceived HR as their people that just fill out forms and organize company picnics. And it was perceived as a low level function that didn't really require any skill. And he said, look, guys, I, you know, HR ultimately decides who we hire and what we hire them for and how we pay them. How can that be anything but one of the most important decisions you make in your company? And if you view that as a low level function that an unskilled person can do, that's not serving your company. And I think the same is really true of marketing in a lot of ways. Uh, I think larger companies may recognize the reality of it more readily, but I think smaller businesses might have the perception that, well, gee, there's all these people on Fiverr.com that can build me a website for two hundred fifty dollars, or you know, they, they think that it's just it, it, it's just grunt work that I can hire anybody to do, and it should be cheap. And you certainly can hire somebody cheap, but if you think about marketing as a strategic consideration in your business. That really, I mean, there are aspects of marketing I believe really cannot be delegated because the business owner has to decide who am I going to target as, as my market? Who am I going to build my business to ultimately serve? And a professional can help you make that decision, can maybe help guide that decision by asking certain questions, maybe helping with doing some research. But I think, unfortunately, the, the reality is a lot of business owners just don't make that decision. They just abdicate those high level decisions and think, well, I'll just hire somebody to do it for me. And then they're disappointed when the results don't come. Or or they tried the do-it-yourself approach with the, the, the template builder thing. And it mm -hmm. seems to be pretty epidemic. Um, you know, I was working on a, a guide just the other day on digital marketing uh, budgets. And I was halfway through it. And then it occurred to me, you can't finish this. Because until you talk about the pain resistance formula, where there's always this pushback, I can't diagnose the issues if you won't talk to me about the issues. So until you address that, you really can't talk about budget or doing the work that's going to move them forward. So how do you move beyond that, that, that resistance? where you know it's like that meme where they showed the gunslingers and one guy says well what's your budget and the other gunslinger says well how you know what's how much is a website or whatever yeah it's you know the classic poker game of trying to selling a marketing service yeah right it becomes in the it, the client wants the cheapest price possible so they're playing poker with their the cards against their chest you need to know what their budget is to determine if it's realistic or not, so I can help you meet your stated objectives. Mm -hmm. It's a huge problem for freelancers, but on the flip side, it's a huge problem for business owners, whether they know it or not. So how do we move beyond that? I mean, I think my general approach to solving that problem is, I, mean, I, I can understand when there's no trust established, the perception is, and I think there, there's some truth to it because there are some uh, marketing agencies that basically have the mentality that I want to make sure to use up every dollar of whatever budget you name. And I work I, for I a few. Where, yeah. yeah, that's so. So it could easily be that the customer might be thinking, well, I could spend ten thousand dollars, but if I tell them ten thousand dollars, then the five thousand dollar solution might become a ten thousand dollar solution. So I can understand when there's no trust established that that might be the perception. I think my general approach. Uh, that seems to have worked the best in most cases is to basically come back, come out with a with a range of number and, and, and not say, OK, here's a hard quote of here's what I'll what my price is, because I don't want to lock myself in at a price. But I might say, OK, here's you know, if, if you can spend two to three thousand dollars, here's what you the type of solution you can buy for that. You know, if you're needing more something like this and that's more of a five to ten thousand dollar proposition uh if you if you're looking for you know whatever it is just just kind of i speak in generalities but give some indication of what the, the numbers might look like and 
if there's if I do any kind of a decent job building trust, at some point they'll come back and be like, all right, well, I can't spend that, but what what about fifteen hundred dollars? What can you do for that? So, but it seems like they just, just nobody wants to be the first one to name a number. So I think if you give them something to start with, they feel a little bit better, is what I found. Yeah, now I want to backtrack a little bit because I really want to dig a little bit deeper into that, uh, especially for freelancers um, and for the business owners who, who who want more meat on the bones of that. Going backward a little bit now for for you, how do you define your velvet rope policy? I mean, that's what I call it, mm -hmm. but it's basically ideal identify who is your ideal consumer who's the right fit for you dave and and how do you how do you come to that well when i think about a velvet rope as far as the the hard line between at what point can we not do business with each other i mean for right. me the big thing the big non-negotiable is do i know that you'll do what you say you're going to do as far as when we agree on payment terms and obviously you can't figure that out at up front in the relationship, but I can usually get a sense of it by, by the way they talk about money. But I think that what I, my, the goal of my velvet rope, any velvet rope I set up is I'm, I try to avoid the people that have the mentality of, I just want to buy the cheapest solution possible. Right. So I, I will in, intentionally try to not uh, whatever price quotes that I give, I, I try to not sound like I'm the cheapest just so that it'll be unattractive to people that are specifically just shopping for price. But I, I, I try to avoid getting too much into price in the beginning because I think it, the conversation needs to be about value. But the other, I, I think there's payment terms or another one that for me, you know, can really make the difference that can tell you can be an indicator of whether a client is the right type of client or not for a lot of times if i'm doing a flat like a, a monthly ongoing service i'll i'll quote a flat price I, I really try to avoid charging by the hour if i can avoid it at all uh because I, I feel like that just sets up the wrong type of relationship but and that's something we can go into if you want to but as far as the sure. velvet rope piece the if i flat price something i'll say okay well i'll give you a flat quote but each month has to be paid in advance uh, and, and I found Absolutely. that anybody who anybody who balks at that, it, it makes me start to wonder. Well, do they just not intend to pay at all? Because uh, that's why you know, it, it's, or it was just as the trust level so low, or or do they have the mentality that well, I'll let me see if I like the work first, and then I'll decide if I want to pay for it. That so you know we've all run into those types of customers. That that's to me so, what a velvet rope should should weed out. Yeah, so but, solve my problem first. Then after yeah. you solve it, I'll pay you. If mm -hmm. I like it, if I like yep. the way you solved it. Uh-huh. So it's, and I think the other piece I'll, I'll just mention about the, the velvet rope, which I help find is really helpful for avoiding those types of situations is I do a lot of my work by referral and I'm at the point now where I, I almost, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's very few people I would really even be interested in working it with right off the street, unless I was really convinced that it was, they were just a really good fit. But what I really like with working by referral or working on a subcontract basis is someone else, another professional in my sphere has already developed a relationship with this person. They can vouch for them and say, yeah, this, this is, they're, they're a great client because I've worked with them before. Uh, yeah, or they can tell me like, okay, they're, they're generally pretty good, but here's something you might want to watch out for that, you know, that, that they've already worked with someone else. That's, that to me is really the best vel red velvet rope you can ask for because it's there's only so much I can tell from a, a conversation with a stranger. Yeah, and I think the thing with referrals too is to not wait for the referral to get in touch with you, but to be the one to make initial contact so that you can begin to mm -hmm. guide the conversation. Because if you wait for the referral to get in touch with you, the first question is going to be how much? Mm-hmm rather than i have these problems can you resolve these problems what do you think of them well and i think it's depending on the nature of the referral some situations that i've worked in it's a little bit tighter of, of a situation where it's it's more like a subcontract it's somewhere in the nexus between subcontract and referral where i actually do part of the pricing and terms negotiation with the person who's referring them in advance so those expectations have already been set by the time i even talk to mm. their their client and it, it actually helps to really, by the time I talk to the client, 
I, I have a very high confidence level that there's a good fit because we've been able to figure out, you know, it, it's because I know I've had a couple of those those conversations start and we quickly determined that it was not a fit before I ever talked to it. I know we just ended up not talking. So, yeah, it, it took me a while working for marketing agencies. Obviously, you have that overhead and that structure where they do everything mm -hmm. for you. So you act, you just do the work and you get paid. You don't really interface with the clients as far as sales or or what's the word I'm looking for, matriculation or enrollment into services or, or a set program. But then freelancing, you have to learn how to apply the structure of the agency to you, the individual. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's where it really became difficult. It took me a couple of years to learn how to do that. So for me personally, I had to say, if you haven't been in business for five years, that's strike number one. If you don't have any employees and you're a solopreneur, one person, that's kind of strike number two. I mean, it's possible. Um, you know, do you have a physical brick and mortar location? If they don't, that's another thing to consider. So you kind of ask questions that will help you determine if they're actually going to make enough annually that they would mm -hmm. be able to afford what I call adult level marketing. Yep, absolutely. You know, and, yeah, move, and move beyond this savior complex where I've got to do everything myself by myself. You know, um, let me ask you. Well, first of all, I wanted to backtrack too because you brought up a really uh, good point about hourly versus the project thing because so many people are the business owner. Most business owners, I don't think, really are familiar or comfortable with a concept beyond paying by the hour because they look at a yeah. service provider and they think, well, how much is it per hour to fix my car or something? So what's the hourly rate? But the, the yeah. you know, how do you get them to think beyond paying me to solve problems? Well, what part of the selling point for me, and because a lot of what I'm doing right now is is ongoing monthly deliverables that are the same every month. So part of the selling point is, you know, it's the, the benefit to the customer is, you know, what your bill is going to be every month. And it's, there's not this lingering doubt of how much am I running up my charges and am I going to be surprised with a $2,500 invoice when I'm used to paying, you know, $1,200 a month or something like that. Yeah. And so I, I think that's kind of the selling point. But uh, mm -hmm. and I think the, the other I, I guess the way that I haven't really had too much pushback for as far as, you know, I, I've not met too many people that actually preferred to pay by the hour, but that there have been some of those, but that where I think it's more of that, then that was just their mentality. That's what they were used to. But I've, I've found, I think the, the issue I've seen with, if you set the expectation from the beginning that it's going to be a by the hour type of, a, of an arrangement, there's two issues that I've, I've mainly seen come up from that. One is that the client thinks of you more like an employee than an outside expert. And then they feel entitled to whatever they want help with. Well, you're getting paid by the hour, so you should be you know, on hand. So I think it doesn't set up the type of mutual professional respect that I think is more appropriate for a client service provider relationship. But and you know, I think obviously from a cost standpoint, what the, the, the issue they can create is that they don't if they know that every time they pick up the phone and call you, their bill is going to be bigger. They don't want to ask for your help. It, it's more of they'll think, well, I'll just do it myself and save money that that can sometimes come up. And then then it ends up being, well, now, now you screwed it up and now it's going to actually take more time to fix it. And then it creates this tension. But, yeah, I, I think when cost sensitivity is an issue and it's and it's a by the hour arrangement, you can easily have. Uh, grumbling and tension where the client's really not happy with the size of their bill, but they may not necessarily say anything about it. Uh, and, and then that can kind of create a, a strain on the relationship. So uh, not a, not an issue every single time, obviously. I mean, some some of the larger clients, they, you know, they might just kind of, you know, they're used to paying by the hour and that's how they want to do it. But I, I think that when I, the challenge with flat pricing, obviously, is it puts a lot more onus on me, the service provider, to be efficient with my time. Uh, because it takes longer than I, then that's that's taking food off of my table. But 
I, I think the key to really navigating this is you've got to be really diligent about tracking your usage of time. And, you know, I use a tool called Toggle, which has a free version and a paid version. Yeah, but I've heard of it. I, I, I'm very religious about every second I spend working on something. I, I turn, I run that timer and I look at it every week and I figure out how am I doing profitability and you know, what's my yield per hour ultimately. And does this signify that maybe I need to be charging more for the flat rate deliverables? But um, that that has been generally my preferred method of doing it. I mean, I think the, the thing I really like about it from a negotiation standpoint is that there's it takes all negotiation off the table as soon as a flat rate is agreed on because it's pre-negotiated. So uh, as I, I think with an hourly rate, you end up with potentially the issue of you end up negotiating the rate after you've completed the work in effect because there's the potential for the client pushing back and saying, I don't, I don't see why it had to take this many hours to do this. Well, so. that, that's true. I mean, that's a really good point because they could just try to rush you. Well, it shouldn't take that mm -hmm. long. Or you, or you know what? I want less now so you can try to yep. get finish the job that much faster. So you're basically robbing Peter to pay Paul. But mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely prefer the flat rate because like you said, it – it lets you take your time and do a very um, more workmanlike, methodical approach. Mm -hmm. You can get up and go get something to eat for something that you know is going to take four hours or whatever, as opposed to having to rush or what have you. Where you know, if you look at a lawyer, it could take them fifteen minutes to submit paperwork for you or a contract or something, but they're going to bill you for that hour. And they're going to build what they want because they have the area of expertise that the average person doesn't in the consumer or the business owner knows that and respects that. Whereas mm -hmm. with marketing, that's the perception that it's a single item or something that anyone can do. So it's, it's, it presents challenges to work through. What do you think is the best way to communicate? Not just value, but also you know, your expertise and the ability to help the, you know, the potential client, the business owner resolve costly issues that they're dealing with? Well, I mean, I, I think that is, in my experience, easier to show than than talk about. But I but I think sometimes I might give examples of things that I have done in the past. Like I, I know that sometimes when I'm going into a client's books, I might find that there's there's expenses that don't need to be paid for. Sometimes I might find that there's, for instance, I'll call it a money leak where there's a subscription service that continues to bill every month. And, oh, gee, I forgot I was paying for that. And there that and it may and it might be I mean, depending on if a business is making a lot of money, it can be substantial. It could be, you know, a. Uh, well, there's a, a $250 a month software subscription and nobody's used it in two years. So those those kinds of things. But I think also there's some compliance issues. I mean, it, but any, anyhow, I mean, without going deep into the weeds about it, I think I can uh, my general thought process is I'll just kind of give examples of and, and tell stories and and uh, focus on kind of the, the emotional impact of what clients have shared with me about. You know, and, and I hear a lot of times the one that, that I hear often is the the feeling of relief of just knowing that the the client who felt isolated and like you said trying to do it all themselves and trying to think about all the problems with with really no assistance with making some of those higher level decisions when they feel like there's somebody else in their corner that they're not you know they that they feel like there's not as much weight on their shoulders anymore and so I, I think a lot of clients I know have been able to relate to that. Uh, just in terms of some of the things that, that keep a business owner up at night, because it, it can be a lonely path to walk owning a business, especially when you have employees and the employees have the mentality of, you know, I, I punch a clock, I show up and I do the job I was hired to do. And but whether the business makes money or not, well, that's not my problem. That's the owner's problem. And you right. know, I think a lot of people in an employee situation don't really know what it's like to own a business and, and know what it's like when, yeah, there you have nobody to pass the buck to because it's all on your plate at the end of the day. So uh, I, I try to really convey that when I talk to business owners because I think that's a lot of what the value is is in working with somebody else who's uh, you know owned a company. You know, I'm, I'm I try to take as much of that off their plate as much as I can and, and help an owner feel like they're not completely alone and isolated in what they're needing to to deal with. Well, let me uh, kind of switch directions. 
and kind of backtrack a little bit. How can business owners gauge the health of their business overall? Um, because it seems like a lot of businesses, they, they may be carrying a lot of debt. Or they may be bleeding money in, in ways that they don't know, like you, you said with these subscription services that they that they don't need or, or haven't used in years or fines that they've accrued and they're not aware of or somebody taking money from the company even. How mm -hmm. can they gauge the health of their businesses? And then to take that a step further, how can they know if they're going to be competitive at some point if they're new? Well, I, th I mean, I think the big thing is you got to be in the habit of looking at your financial statements on a monthly basis. And, uh, you know, it, it's not enough to simply hire a bookkeeper and think that, you know, the, the you don't need to look at the books because you pay somebody to do that. I think it's you, you can pay somebody to do your books for you, but you can't pay somebody to look at it with your own eyes and, and make sure you understand what the implications are. I think the, get, the health of a company, it really boils down to cash flow. And yeah. well, I and mean, there's other factors besides cash flow, but cash flow is if you get that wrong, it doesn't matter if you get everything else right. So the one of the things that a lot of times business owners get tripped up about is I mean, I've met business owners that have been in business 10, 20 years and have never looked at, a, at their balance sheet and don't even know what they're looking at when they see one. Uh, or you know, the, the other situation I see sometimes is you look at a, at a profit and loss statement and it says, well, it, it says we had we showed a ten thousand dollar profit last month. Why isn't there another ten thousand dollars in the bank from from where we started? I, I'm, I've got you know, so there's a lot of those misunderstandings about those things. But but a lot of times they just look at numbers on the on, on a statement and say I have no idea what that number even means. But a couple things that a a bookkeeping system will not do for you automatically unless you are in take make the deliberate effort. And it's kind of like what I said about marketing. You've got to have a some strategic level decisions that you need to make about pricing and financial considerations. But one of the things that you have to be able to look at as a business owner is of all the customers that are currently on you know I'm currently working with, how profitable is each one? And a lot of times uh, a business can't measure that or doesn't have any good way to measure that. A bookkeeping system won't do that for you without the without right controls in place. But the other uh, kind of what other issue can pop up is if you're paying employees, do you know who's contributing to money to your bottom line or who's taking money off of your bottom line? Do you actually have a way to gauge how productive each employee is? And that comes back to time utilization, it comes back to a number of different factors. But you, know, you can measure these things with a bookkeeping system, but there, there are certain disciplines that you have to put in place. A lot of it comes back down to tracking time utilization by project. A lot of small businesses don't do that, or, or maybe they've, but they've got software that they think does that, but they're not really using it correctly. But at the end of the day, if you look at, I mean, anybody can tell pretty easily how much revenue you collected from each client, but the hard part is telling where your costs went uh, from, from each client uh, standpoint. And so a lot of times, you you just know what your total revenue was. You know how much client contributed to, in terms of a revenue standpoint, but you look at your payroll, you look at your overhead and all your different costs. Some of your, I mean, your your rent on your building is fixed. That's not that's just kind of on an average. But payroll is, is the big one where I'm I'm paying these people 40 hours a week, but I don't really know what they were working on during that time. And the big piece is the opportunity cost because. If, if you ever heard of, uh, I think, what was it, uh, Parkinson's Law or, or the, the idea that uh, work expands to mm -hmm. sort of fill the time available for its completion. So, you know, if, if every hour that somebody is working on something that's unproductive is time that they're not available for something else. So it's. I, I don't have employees for a reason because I, I, I frankly, I, I know too much <laughs> for my own good about how many different issues you can run into there. But the the, the overall health of business really boils down to profitability and cash flow. And you have to be able to go beyond the, the 30,000 feet view and get more granular and get into those numbers. And that's it's something that a lot of bookkeepers don't really know how to do. And it's a lot of business owners are, are really not either not willing to make the effort or don't understand how to really even ask those right questions about it. I think a lot of bookkeepers can be trained to do it, but 
I think is a, it's really important for the business owner to push back and say, you know, to go back to your bookkeeper and say, I need you to explain to me why these numbers are showing up the way they are. And if they can't answer those questions, you may need a new bookkeeper. So or, or would, maybe you, uh, would that be the role of like a, a forensic accountant, perhaps? Potentially a forensic accountant, if you're, I mean, depending on how, how deep you want to get into historical financials and that kind of thing, or a uh, fractional CFO can do some of that analysis also. But yeah, that's, I, I think that depending on the, how complex the, the, the books are in, in your business and how skilled the bookkeeper is, it's the, the role can shift from, from one person to another. But, um, but yeah, I think it's really from a business owner standpoint, it really all starts with asking the right questions and, and understanding what the numbers mean. Okay. Are there any big giant accounting red flags that you can think of so that a business owner would know if they see one of these red flags, that they're just not looking at their P&L statement or their balance sheet. They're not, they're just not looking at it correctly or I need to go find an expert. If yeah, I mean, a couple, a couple things that I can say right off the bat is if I look at books and I can tell and I see they haven't been reconciled, then I have no no confidence whatsoever that the numbers are accurate at all, because that basically means that you have not compared the bank balance to the book balance every at the end of every month. That's the most basic, simple thing that I've, I've seen people not do that. But the other piece is uh, so a couple of really weird things. If you look on a balance sheet and I mean, I've seen balance sheets with a, a bank balance showing in the negative tens of thousands of dollars. And, and I said, well, you know, the bank's not going to let you overdraw your account by $10,000. So something's clearly wrong here. I mean, I've seen an accounts receivable balance that's negative in the, into the five digits, which basically would mean that you're saying on your books that you owe money back to your customer because they overpaid you by 50 or $60,000, which to me, it just says is what's more likely is, the, the books are grossly misstated and something's, something's wrong here. Um, I, I've also seen, I mean, a couple of other things are like on a P&L statement, if I see a large amount of money in uh, other miscellaneous expense or something, or some generic category like that, then, so, I mean, it's not necessarily always nefarious. It's not always dishonest. It might just be that the bookkeeper just got lazy and started dumping a bunch of money into a category because they just didn't want to deal with it. But you know, I, I think um, the only other piece when you look at a, at a P&L statement is if there's just an unusual amount of variation in a category from month to month, or if there's just a really big amount of money in a category that seems really weird for it to be there, or, you know, I, I've, I've seen all those those different kinds of things. I mean, if there's, if there's a lot of variation in a category and somebody can't explain why, I, I think if, if there's any question of potential dishonesty, a lot of it just comes down to asking questions of whoever's been handling the books and kind of seeing how they react to the questions. If, if they start getting dodgy or avoiding the questions, you know, I, I don't get too deep into anything with, with forensics or any of those fields, but um, I think more of the issues I've found have just been related to sloppy bookkeeping or, you know, bookkeepers that you had too many different hands in the pot and, and nobody was talking to each other, those kinds of things. But there, I, I've actually, we have, I mean, I have run into, not that I've dealt with directly, but I've talked to some, some other people in the field that have run into situations where you look at the books and you can tell somebody's, somebody's taking cash out of the company. It's a bigger issue in retail businesses. I know I had, uh, I did see one situation where it was a retail business that they had a point of sale system that would record cash sales and then there were deposits to the bank, but the deposits were short. And I could never say definitively that there was necessarily theft, but, you know, because there was some sloppiness with petty cash and expenses and those kinds of things. But I remember I had to keep pointing out, well, you know, somebody needs to figure out why there's this deficit and between the deposits and this needs to be accounted for because oh, yeah. uh, I, I remember having the distinct impression that there was a, a strong possibility that there was money walking away. Uh, I'm sure there was. What are some of the most common issues that would cause a business to, or business owner rather, to lose focus on their core business? Well, I think a lot of it's human nature and the tendency to just get excited about the latest idea. Or, or I see an article on LinkedIn about the hottest new business trend and think, oh, I, I got to do that. Or, you know, but I, I, I think one of the questions is, you know, what, what ultimately causes a company to lose focus on a core business is 
not really having a keen enough understanding of what their core business is in the first place. One of uh, my favorite business authors on this subject is Jim Collins and people, most common book that people have heard of from him is Good to Great, but he's got some other excellent books too, like such as Great by Choice, which I, I think is actually more focused on the earlier stages of companies before they were big. And uh, there's also How the Mighty Fall, which talks about companies that were doing well and, and collapsed. And every single one of his books, the biggest issue that he always comes back to is losing focus on their core business. And uh, one of the, the examples that was a really good illustrative example was Southwest Airlines. Actually, people don't know this, but they basically copied almost all of their business model from Pacific Southwest Airlines, which at the time they actually didn't consider them competitors because they were flying in different regions of the country and they really weren't, uh, they didn't have any concerns about that. So they actually went and visited the headquarters at PSA and they actually allowed them to make photocopies of their operating manuals and, and just showed them, opened up everything and showed them how they were doing everything. But interestingly enough, Pacific Southwest Airlines, and this was in Great by Choice where he talks about this story, they said it was a fascinating story because they were almost identical clones because of the fact that, that they copied the operating manuals. But Southwest, we all know, has done very well. And Pacific Southwest Airlines, a lot of why they did not do as well is because they made a couple of pretty big errors. One was they got they tried to get into the hotel and rental car industry in addition to the airlines. And they thought, oh, well, it's all travel. This all fits in all our wheelhouse but they failed to do their due diligence and really figure out what the full logistical implications were. And they basically ran out of those industries with their tail between their legs, having lost a lot of money. And, uh, you know, those are his books are filled with examples like that of you know, businesses that I mean, this is and this can include bigger companies. It's not just small businesses that, you know, they they start chasing shiny objects and, uh, you know, they 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 forget that what they the success that they built their company on is is what probably makes sense to continue to focus on. It doesn't mean you never change. It doesn't mean you don't open new service lines, but the successful companies that he talks about had tended to take a very slow, methodical and conservative approach to any kind of a new business venture. And one of his principles was uh, fire bullets before you fire cannonballs, as he said it. And, you know, just the, the three criteria was that it, that a, new venture, a new idea, it needs to, to be low risk, low cost, and low distraction. So you can basically just try it out. If it doesn't work, who cares? Well, we'll move on. And then uh, even Walgreens infamously did this, and he talked about it in, in Good to Great, where they were slow and skeptical about going on the internet in, in the, the late 90s when everybody was going nuts about the internet. But they said, no, nah, we're, we're going to wait. We're going to hold back and see. And, and we're going to be slow and deliberate about figuring out how to put this in our business model. I mean, and, and they're actually a great example of a company that has implemented the Internet very well because they yeah. followed such a slow, methodical approach about it. So uh, those are just a couple of examples. But I mean, I think it really comes back to you got If you haven't sat down and thought about what exactly is my core business, and what's not my core business? You know, what what opportunities am I interested in? What am I not interested in as a company? And and really, I think that takes deliberate effort. That I think a lot of small businesses maybe they do it once a year, but it, it, you know it, it's it, I think it needs to be a more than a once a year effort uh, because you can write a business plan that ends up in a in a file cabinet that you never look at again. <laughs> so, do you think it's toward that end? Is it still relevant? and you know helpful and valuable for business to go through the purpose of you know what's your mission statement um your you know your consumer avatar putting together the business plan then having the digital marketing plan do you think that level of i know methodicalness is not a real word but is is that level of forethought still relevant or, or can they bypass that? I, I mean, I think a, a mission statement is is definitely important. I, I like actually separating a vision statement from a mission statement. And I think of a vision statement as the end goal of where you're trying to get to. Okay. 
the mission statement is how how do you choose to get there? Jack Welch did some good writing on on vision and mission statements. I love how he talks about how he, he says a lot of companies the way they write a, a, a mission statement is basically a a uh, collection of generic platitudes to hang on the wall <laughs> it refers to it. But if you do it correctly, it, it's specificity is really the key word. One example I like to go back to is Starbucks did a really good one back around 2005 ish. I think sometime in there where it was, they laid out their mission statement in terms of what they wanted to do, what their, their products, their, their employees, their competitors, their supply chain. I mean, they, they laid out, it's, I, I believe it's still out there. Mm. Uh, somebody could find that, but yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the contrasting example of the generic platitudes, we've seen these mission statements all the time where it's, we are committed to absolute hundred percent quality and dealing with integrity and all, and, and, and a bunch of these just meaningless fluff words that really don't say anything. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, how do you, how do you do this on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. You know, where well, the rubber meets the road, what does that really mean in human speak? And if you ask them that, they'll just send you back a form letter. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I think it's you, you can't solve this problem with bureaucracy and, and surveys and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I think, yeah, to your point, you have to, you have to translate. OK, if you want to say that integrity is a core value, for instance, one buzzword people love to throw out there all the time. To me, the question is, OK, what does a lack of integrity look like and in, in, in the way that you see it in your language? And let's look at some specific examples. And that's why for, for me, it's, you know, I'm I, one of my things that I look at for integrity is I'm committed to paying my bills on time or, you know, and, and doing what I say I'm going to do with uh, payment terms. And, and I only deal with people who do the same thing uh, or, you know, but every, somebody else might have a different different language but and i think the other thing that i look at is everything that i recommend to my custom to my clients or anybody that i'm working with is based on what i am currently doing now and and that i have a system of accountability in place to measure what i did this this past week um i may recommend something that i haven't done but it's going to be with a proviso that hey this this is kind of an, i'm stepping out on a limb here because this isn't something i've actually done but that to me is an example of integrity because I've seen so many consultants that recommend theories they've never tried themselves. And I, and I always think, well, if you don't believe it enough in it enough to do it in your business, why would you believe in it? Tell somebody they should do it in their business. So, uh, but I, I think that the point is, is comes down to specificity. You know, any, anybody can, has, we've all had our own different experiences. And I think if we look at what's not your mission, what's not your focus, that's going to tell you what is your mission and your focus. That's where that specificity comes from. It's the contrast of light and shadow. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I think if you ask most freelancers or most business owners, you know, who is your ideal fit? Um, they would say anybody with a pulse. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, but the reality is that not everybody with a pulse is really not who you want to work with. So I think the you know you can oh you can definitely overkill and be too specific to the point where it's not realistic or, uh, or achievable for you. But I think it's definitely helpful and important to be more deliberate and really think it through. And I really like that point of looking at the opposite and saying, well, who do I not want to date? Versus who yeah. you do want to date, who do you really want to work for, who you know you can knock it out of the park for the most, the easiest. Well, one, I, one, one point on the customer avatar uh, that I think it, it can trip up a lot of business owners is that I always say, I always tell people, you don't have to announce to everybody who your target market is. I mean, you, you could just basically say, here's what I do. Yeah. I mean, let's say, for example, if I wanted to to, to be the, uh, you know, I want I want to be a, a plumber, a plumbing company, and and I decide I'm going to target optometrists, uh, you know, because I've decided that whatever for whatever reason that in my area they're they're great clients. I don't have to tell anybody. I might just put together privately a list of all the optometrists and and focus my my outbound sales efforts on optometrists. But as far as anybody that I meet out in the world, if they ask me what I do, I can just say, hey, I do I do plumbing, residential and commercial. They don't I, I think where they get tripped up is they say, well, I don't want to I don't want to pick a target market because then everybody's going to think I won't work with anybody else. 
and 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 to me the the, the question is well if you're going to tell people your target market how does that benefit your marketing activity? Is there a reason why your customer needs to know? Because from, from my standpoint, if I'm hiring you to do a service, I don't care who the rest of your customers are. That has nothing to do with me. I think people forget how self-interested their customers are and they think they need to talk about all these things about themselves that really don't matter to the customer. And I think the target market is a great, great, great example of that. So that's I, I, I think if you separate out who am I marketing to, versus you know what what do i talk about as far as you know in my marketing message they can be completely separate considerations so how does it help you and then how could it potentially hinder you to as far as identifying a specific market you mean yes well i i think it can if you in it, it can hinder you the most if you are if you say too many of the wrong things publicly and have to take them back, then that's why I would generally advocate not talking about your target market. But I think you mm. could potentially pick too narrow of a market and realize there's no real market there. If you spend too much of your time and energy trying to pursue uh, you know, a, a segment of the market where there's no real opportunity. And, and I think that's where it just comes back to experimentation. I, I think, one, I, I'm a fan of, I mean, if I were starting with no customers today and I just needed to quickly get started, you know, I, I might put together a list of uh, industries or segments. And, and But, but I, I think if you just start contacting individual people and having individual conversations with one person at a time, that's the lowest cost way to figure out what your market is. And there's really very little risk. I mean, worst case, you have one conversation with somebody and it doesn't go anywhere great. I'll just move on to the next person. I think, you know, sorry, you were going to say something. No, no, no. I agree a hundred percent. And you learn by that experience, hopefully take notes, you know, what, how did this go? What worked, what didn't. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think where it can get detrimental sometimes also is if you're over investing in advertising method or, or especially the wrong advertising methods too early without having done your market research to figure out if that advertising is actually aligned to where the market is. And I think that's where some where a business needs somebody like you to help them figure out how much does it make sense to spend in these different areas. But right. something like saying, okay, I'm going to put 25 grand into Facebook ads and point them to the front page of my website. Uh, you might you might as well just throw twenty five grand in a dumpster because the result's going to be the same. <laughs> I mean, right? The you're, yeah, you're throwing good money after bad if you haven't done any consumer research and you haven't either spent the time necessary to study how Facebook are uh, advertising and ad targeting and how that works with SEO and your content. If you haven't already spent that time or worked with someone to do that analysis for you and how that ties into your own business, then you're most likely going to have a steep uh, hill to climb and you're going to mm -hmm. be throwing away probably a few tens of thousands of dollars while you get acclimated to that and it's an expensive way to learn yeah. um what do you think is the essence of a business strategy and how do people get that confused with a business plan what do they misunderstand about the two well, I, I like the word approach when I when I define what a strategy is, because if you think about an airport and, and if you're flying an airplane towards an airport, you can only approach from one direction. So to me, a strategy is a decision about what way am I going to approach solving a problem? Because I can't, I have finite dollars and finite budget. And so I think that the strategy ultimately is what drives the business plan. A business plan may have a lot more tactics there might be, okay, cold calling is a tactic, advertising is a tactic, and, and there's all these other tactics. But without a strategy, you're just you're basically just doing a bunch of stuff and, and hoping that some of it will work. And admittedly, sometimes it will work. Sometimes you'll get lucky, but you might not get lucky. And so for me, a strategy really comes down to the, the deep thinking that you're doing when you decide, okay, who's my customer, who's not my customer, and why? Why do I want to work with this type of customer and not this type of customer? Why do I want to work in this city versus this city? Why, why do I, you know, you know the, the strategy level questions 
you know, there, there are plenty of things we could do. We just can't do them all. And so the strategy is really the litmus test that says, okay, here's why this approach makes sense instead of using this approach. Because I, I find that a lot of businesses that don't have those strategy level conversations essentially end up just throwing a lot of mud at the wall and, and just doing a lot of activity without really understanding why they're doing the activity. And, and you can, you know, to your earlier question about losing co focus on your core business, uh, I, I think that the strategy ties directly into that because, you know, your your strategy should be driven by a deep understanding of your core business. And so I think you can put the cart before the horse if you try to develop a strategic business plan without really defining the essence of the business itself. Uh, but on the other hand, on the flip side, the, the really neat thing about strategy is that when you def when you do define your business well and you do define a strategy, there's still risk, but there's there's some pretty bold moves you can make and have a very high degree of confidence in them working. I mean, and to give you one more Jim Collins example, there was Kimberly Clark was one of his example of companies that they actually decided to go into direct competition against Procter and Gamble, which was written up in, in magazines and in business publications as an extremely risky move that yeah. their CEO came into a lot of, uh, came under fire for that. But the thing is he, he did his homework. He developed a strategy, figured out that he knew where they were strong. He knew where they weren't strong and he had the data to back it up. I mean, and, and it still feels scary even when you have the data to back up a move like that. But I would argue that it's next to impossible to successfully make that kind of a bold move without a without a strategy that's tied into the core business and without that level of self-awareness at an organizational level. Well, I only have a few more questions left for you. Um, I wanted to ask you, in what ways do you see the business world most likely changing fundamentally over the next 10 to 20 years? And what do you think is likely to stay the same? One thing that I see fundamentally changing in the next 10 to 20 years, we're obviously becoming much more interconnected. We're becoming more globalized. And we're, I mean, this is certainly not a new problem, but I think COVID-19 certainly accelerated that with the fact that people stopped getting together in person as much. And so we started looking for, virtual solutions that we used to only look for in our own local area. So I, I think in the one hand, we're, we're going to be the, the marketplace is going to be a lot more competitive. But I think that that competition is going to drive a lot more innovation. And uh, I, I see that the workforce of the next 20 years is going to be distinctly different from the workforce of the last 20 years in in that there's going to be more fluidity, there's going to be more mixed roles. It used to be that you'd have a team of five or six people that are all full-time employees working for one company, and they've all been there 10 to 20 years. That's going to be the exception rather than the rule going forward. I think you're going to have a mix of maybe full-time employees, equity partners, contractors, some on a part-time basis, and, and possibly, and I'm already seeing it now with the way the, the, the evolution of the workforce is happening is you know, you might even have people that instead of finding one full-time job for a company, and it could even be just kids coming out of school, that, you know, you, you start your own business. But in the meantime, while your business is getting built up, you take several different contract jobs for other companies. And, you know, it's, I, I think it's going to be a fun dynamic. You know, that we're going to see a lot more gig economy type opportunities coming up. And, I, I think full-time employment as we know it is quickly going to become a thing of the past, but what's not going to change is I, I think that the need for, you know, you know, hard work and persistence are always going to be important. That's the need for that is never going to go away. You know, we're, we're always going to, the fundamental truth is, you know, you, you can act without integrity and gain short-term wins, but you don't win in the long term without integrity. And I, I don't think anything about technology or the marketplace can ever make that different. But I think that what will kind of be in that, what will change in, in, is that it will become, I, I believe, we're, we're going to in some ways have an easier time telling how honest somebody is because we've got now bigger digital footprints out in the world. It's a lot harder to hide who you are in the digital world. But then you're going to see at the same time a lot more uh, counterfeiting and fakery techniques. They're going to be that that deception 
is going to create some kind of a chess game, which I think is going to lead to us becoming more discerning uh, as a people. Good thing and a bad thing. I think it'll be good in that we learn the the mental discipline of being discerning and telling truth from lies more because the lies will become more sophisticated. But a bad thing in that I think it's it's I think there's something to be said for trust and building relationships without needing to to see the proof first. And I think we're heading into a culture where people are going to want are going to have increasing levels of suspicion, which I, I'm afraid of that a little bit, because I think, you know, it, it's going to become challenging to just build, tr- you know, person to person trust the way we used to. Um, yeah. So, so I think those are a couple of things that I see shifting in the business world. Mm-hmm. Well, Dave, I, I've really enjoyed our conversation for uh, listeners or, or viewers who would like to get in touch with you. How can they learn more about your services? So you can go to my website is dave-baldwin.com. Don't forget the hyphen. That's that's my my, my business page. And um, you can also there's uh, you can find me on YouTube and it's it's on Baldwin Systems. I can uh, share the link. The link's actually on my web page. But yeah, my main my main website is really the best uh, starting point. That's so dave-baldwin.com. Okay. Well, listen, Dave, I I really appreciate your time speaking with us today. Thank you so much. Please stick around for another minute or two. And for those uh, tuning in, thank you for your time and for your interest. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to like it and subscribe. And if you'd like to submit a question for one of our listener question episodes or apply to be a guest, or book me to be on your own podcast, you can go to dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. I really appreciate it. To learn more about the podcast or where to find episodes or how to apply to be a guest, or submit a question, just go to www.dms.blue slash podcast. Thanks again, and hope to meet you in the next episode.